So, what I want you to do is suppose this morning that you're driving to, it, like you would normally do on a Monday morning maybe, uh, driving to Starbucks. Now, the reason that I, I, I'm using this scenario is because I know a lot of you have that routine. And, and, you know, it, that wouldn't be me. I haven't forgotten how to cook, uh, make coffee at home. But so if if you if you you know that if you get there early, and you you want to get there fast, you know, because like, you know, you might got to get there before all the selfish people, right? And, and so also, you know, so you find yourself find that you're speeding. You're like going like 25 miles over the speed limit. And well, as you do, you pass a police officer. And you notice that, that police officer is looking at you and he's just waving as you go by, just with a smile on his face. And, and, and you, you, know, you notice you go, oh man, I'm going 25 miles over the speed limit. And I didn't get a ticket. So question, does that haunt you? Like, do you like way, lay awake at night just thinking, you know, this isn't fair. You know, I deserve the ticket and I'm going to turn myself in tomorrow and they're going to make and justice is going to be served. No, I, I don't think that you do. You know, uh, but that's kind of reverse the circumstances for a moment. Let's say you're not really speeding, like maybe one, two, maybe miles an hour over speed limit, that, that's allowable, right? But then all of a sudden you look in your rear view mirror and there's that bubble gum machine behind you and you get this big, fat, hefty ticket. And you go, that's not fair. It's just not fair and you're angry. Let's change it up again a little bit. Let's say you get that ticket on the way to church. And maybe you haven't come for a while. And you wake up in the morning, you go, you know, I'm going to go to church today. I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to give my life completely over to the Lord and serve him. And, and as you do, you get that ticket. Well, maybe now you're tempted to say, well, how can a God of love allow me to get a ticket when when all I really want to do is serve him. It just isn't fair. Well, life isn't fair. And, and wouldn't you say that Job's sense of fairness was assaulted after everything that had happened to him? He lost his children. He lost his position. He lost his health. You know, it just lingers on and on, it, and it's a painful disease. And so I want to share with you something that I, I read this past week, and I really love it. I actually wish I had made a slide of this so that you guys could, like, read it while I did, but I, I didn't do that. It's written by My Michael Green. He writes, God does not always choose to heal us physically. And perhaps it's well that he does not. How people would rush to Christianity for all the wrong motives if it carried with it automatic exemption from sickness. What nonsense it would make of Christian virtues like long-suffering, patience, and endurance. You know, if... And I wonder if, uh, if instant wholeness were available to all the Christian sick, what, what wrong impression would that give of salvation if physical wholeness were, were perfectly realized on earth while spiritual wholeness were, were partially reserved for heaven? What very curious thing it would be if God were to decree death for all of his children while not allowing illness for any of them. Well, that's really good wisdom, you know, and it's a good reminder for us. And yet, whenever things go bad, from bad to worse, and we inevitably ask, why? 
I, I know for me, whenever my, my wife's health goes from bad to worse, you know, I ask why, and, and I know she does most every night also. And, you know, um, we, back when I got cancer, I asked why. And, it, you know, it just happens to everyone, but what, when it happens to you, it hurts, and you ask why. Well, I've, we've been looking at Job's suffering here, and we've been, we've been noticing this guy who has everything. He had, he had wealth, health, great family, and then all of a sudden, it's all gone. And so that, that was the message last week, and that's what we're going to continue with this week. And today, we're in chapter 2, and we're going to uh, look at three experiences. The, uh, the resentment of Job's wife is one, and then there's the resolve of Job's will, and then we have the refreshment of Job's friends. Each one of these points will we'll have a principle. And frankly, I, I don't really care if you remember the points, but I do want you to like, grab hold of these principles. Three principles that we're, we're going to look at today. So, so go with me to chapter 2, and we're going to begin with verse 8. And I want to begin there because verse 8 is like the snapshot of Job's desperate condition. And he took for himself a pot shard. Now remember, I said last week that a pot shard is like a broken piece of pottery, like a clay pot that's broken. It's just a piece broken off of it. With which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. Now I want you to picture that. Job is now outside of the city. That, that's, that's where the ash heap was. The ash heap is like, it's, it's like the city dump. Job is in the city dump at, at the place where garbage and dung is burned and the place that dogs look for scraps of food. And now the leading man of the city is not sitting at the, at the, at the gate anymore, but he's now in an ash heap, scraping and scraping away. And now Job is, he is a, he's a social outcast. You know, he's with the rest of the beggars in the rotting slum. And so now what? What should Job do now? What should Job's course be now after, after losing all of that? Well, his wife has an idea. And so... His wife steps in to give him some advice. Verse 9. Let's look at it. Then his wife said to him, now let's stop there for a minute. Then his wife said to him. That word then is, is very important here in, the, in this passage. I'll tell you why it's important. Children have died. Property has been destroyed. Everything has been lost. And her husband is diseased. And then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Well, she says, Quit being so holy about this, Job. If, you're, if you just blaspheme God... He'll strike you dead. It's better to die quickly than to linger on and live. Now, Mrs. Job, that's what I'm going to choose to call her. Mrs. Job, I believe, has suffered at the hands of many a scholar and at the mouths of many a preacher, self-included. And I think that she's gotten a bad rap, so to speak, you know, I did a little study, and, and I, I realized that it was Augustine who labeled her as the devil's advocate. John Christosom called her the devil's best scourge. He said this, he said, why did the devil leave uh, him his wife? Well, because he thought her a good scourge by which to plague him more 
acutely than by any other means. And even my, my friend here, got John Calvin, called her the embodiment of Satan. Now, I think it's a little unfair. You know, I think Mrs. Job has been treated a, a bit unfairly. After all, these weren't just Job's kids that died. They were hers as well. And remember, there was 10 of them. All of them died at one time. And then there was losing what, all their wealth all at once. And, and now here's her husband. He's, he's extremely ill. There doesn't seem to be like any hope. And uh, she just doesn't know what to do. He's suffering. She's not able to help. You know, I think we would find any woman, any mother, you know, any wife would be distraught and emotional in that situation. And, and that's just what that is. That is her, her emotional reaction. Now, I was reading uh, how these two research PhDs tell us how, how our brains are hardwired to experience emotion first, that, that every impulse that we have, whether it is touch, sight, sound, whatever it is, go, it goes through the spinal cord into the brain at the, at the base of the skull. And before it gets to the frontal lobe where rational thought is conducted, where reason and logic is employed, it must first go through the limbic system. That, that's, where, that's where we emote. That, that's, that's where we have our emotions. And so the authors are pointing out that we have emotion before we have logic. So this is her emotional outburst before she deals with how she feels. And so she lets, she lets it out, you know. And, and so, you know, it, it doesn't really take her completely off the hook, though. She did say, curse God and die. Blaspheming God is never a good idea under any circumstance. And Job will rightly rebuke her for that. Now, what she doesn't know when she says, curse God and die, is that this is exactly what Satan told God Job would do if God took away all, all that Job had had. He'll curse you to your face, he said. Let's, let's look at it for a minute. Verse 1, chapter 11. You can turn your back to verse 1. Satan says, and this is a challenge, Stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Job did not do that in chapter 1. But again, in chapter 2, verse 5, it says, But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. So, so you've got to know that when, when she says, Dude, curse God and die, you know, that Satan is, and, and half of his demons are going, yes, that, that's, do that. He did not do that. Here's the principle. First one, if you're taking notes, you might want to write it down. Good people can give bad advice. Good people can give bad advice. Now, if you, you might be will, well-meaning people in your life, you know, and when you suffer, they can give you dumb advice. And, and this is just a good example of that. People do not always have that divine viewpoint. They may love you, they may mean well for you, but they may not always think like God thinks. And so there's, always, there's only one source for a divine viewpoint, and it's not a preacher, it's not a counselor, or a Christian book. It's this book. This book, it's the divine viewpoint for all of life. So no matter who you listen to, it has to be filtered through the truth of this divine viewpoint. So good people can give 
bad advice. In fact, I'll take it a step further. Satan can work through people that are dear to you. You know, uh, you know do you believe that? It, it's true. Do you remember when Jesus announced to his disciples that we were going to, that he was going to Jerusalem to suffer and, and, and that he was going to be arrested and that they were going to beat him and that they were going to kill him? Do you remember what Peter immediately, what his immediate reaction was? He said, far be it from you, Lord. And so here's Peter. Hey, I'm going to save Jesus. Far be it from you, Lord. This can't happen to you. Now, he thought he was going to get a pat on the back, you know, and uh, uh, that a boy, you know. But, so uh, instead, Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are speaking not as God would speak, but as man would speak. And so you see the reason Jesus came to, to the earth was to die on the cross, and here's Peter trying to say, well, we're going to protect you from that, Jesus. And so he said, I recognize that voice. Jesus says, I recognize that voice. That is exactly what Satan wants. He wants to keep me from going to the cross. Peter was a friend. He was a friend. He was well-meaning, but this is not good, solid advice. And so... There, there are plenty of other examples I could cite. Um, you can remember Adam listened to Eve, right? You know how all that turned out. There, were, there, were, there was like Sarah gave advice to Abraham. You know, like, like she, what did she say? You know, there's no way I'm going to have a child. So go into my handmaiden Hagar, have a baby with her. And, and so like that was like bad advice. You know, um, so Job's wife, yeah, Mrs. Job, says, let's get it over with, quit now, curse God, and die. That's never good advice. When life is difficult, when life goes from bad to worse, it's easy to give up. It's also very the very worst thing that you can do. That is, what is the one thing that we remember Job for? You know, is it his good looks? Is it the fact that he maybe, is he remembered because he built a great city or something? No, he's none of that. In James, in the New Testament, he, James says, for you have heard of the patience or, or the perseverance or the endurance of Job Job was remembered for his perseverance. So that is the resentment of Job's wife. Now let's look at verse 10. We're looking at now the resolve of Job's will. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speak. Uh, that must have been hard for Job to say. You know, he loves his wife, but it needed to be said. She, she was talking like a fool, not, not a silly, ridiculous person, but somebody who lacked real discernment when she said that. And, and here's the reason. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? And that is great theology. Honey, we've been blessed by God. L look at all that he's given us. We we've been so comfortable. We've had it all. Couldn't God just be allowed to give us adversity? Honey, both come from God. Both come from God. It it's, it's good theology. In fact... Wouldn't you agree that affliction provides the contrast to make times of blessing more pleasurable? Yeah, I don't know how early you guys got up this morning, but it was pretty early for me this morning as I get here as we start to set up. And, you know, it was 
cool out and crisp out. And, you know, I just enjoy that so much. You know, but why is that? It's because I contrast that with our summers here. I mean, it can be miserable, really, really hot. And so because my brain goes there and I contrast that, I really enjoy the cool and crispness of the air. So when you're going through a, a pleasurable time, it's, it, and it's so enjoyable because you can compare that to something that's not so pleasurable. Honey, God gives both. Gives affliction as well as a blessing. And I remember hearing this quote from an old time preacher and author. His name was Samuel Rutherford. He lived back in the 1600s and he was persecuted and he suffered a lot. He said, why should I tremble at the plow of my Lord that makes deep furrows in my soul? I know he is no idle husbandman. He purposes a crop. Do you understand what truth that is? Why should I tremble when God cuts deeply into my life, when it hurts? It's like the pain is searing into my experience. He's just not wanting to make us hurt and go, you know, how does that feel? You know, that he has a purpose. He has a purpose. The purpose is fruit, a crop. Some, something good is going to come out of it. And that's why in a time of crisis, our first question should not be, how can I get out of this? But how, what can I get out of this? What can I get out of this? You know, there's a principle, and, 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 and it's the second principle now in, in, in our story here. In a time of crisis, truth will make you stable. In a time of crisis, truth will make you stable. When your life goes from bad to worse, and trust me, there will be times when it does. When your life goes from bad to worse, sound theology will keep you strong. Isn't it amazing how, how Job, after all these cataclysmic events, would think so clearly and so correctly and so lucidly. Honey, shall we not accept adversity as well as good? And so here's the, the final resolve, the, the end of that verse. In all this, in all of this, after all that Job lost, after his 10 children are dead, his property is gone, his health is gone, after all this, Job did not sin with his lips. So, here, so here's what Job understands. Job at this point understands what we talked about last week and what we continue to talk about this week. And remember that little syllogism that I gave you back last week? Number one, evil exists. Number two, God allows evil in the world to exist. And number three, and we just touched on it last week, and what we're going to do is amplify this this week. God has a purpose for evil to exist in our lives. God has a purpose. Now, some of you hearing that will immediately go, well, what purpose could God possibly have for things like earthquakes or hurricanes or, or, or accidents? You know? Well, you know, our universe is governed by natural laws that are really a blessing. And one of them is the law of gravity. Aren't you glad for that law? If there, if there weren't gravity, the moment you were born, you, you, they'd cut the cord and you'd just like float up. In three minutes, you'd be dead. It keeps you tethered. It keeps grounded. 
But because of the law of gravity, if you fall off your bicycle or you fall off a building, you know, there, there are consequences for, for that blessing of that natural law. I was thinking about hurricanes. And I was, you know, as devastating as they are, and I, I Googled it, I looked it up, and there are like five reasons I read about where, you know, they actually are good for the earth. Now, the truth is, those things were so long and detailed, there's no way I could explain them to you today. So here's my, my suggestion to you. If you really are interested, Google it when you get home. Fault lines, they're, they're necessary. Ten tectonic plates on the earth that keep that whole thing together. If there were no plates, the earth would like cool down and it would stop turning on its axis and we'd be in a heap of trouble. But if you build your home on a fault line, or worse yet, if someone built a city on a fault line, you know, and it moves, it's a little ridiculous to stand outside there and shake your fist at God and say, how could you? <laughs> you built the house there. Now let me, let me take it a step further. Let's make it personal. Suffering in the hands of a loving God can be used to bring about great good. This explanation comes from Peter Kreeft, a philosopher who, and, and I found it to be a good example. He said, imagine a bear is trapped in a cage and, and the hunter is on the outside and, and the hunter wants to release the bear. And so the, the bear doesn't know this. You know, it, it, the hunter could say like, um, excuse me, Mr. Bear, I, I want to set you free. You know, would, that, that wouldn't do much good. You know, the, the hunter, uh, the bear doesn't understand humanese or whatever English, language is being spoken. You know, it wouldn't do any good at all. So the hunter raises his gun to shoot a hypodermic dart to sedate the bear. What does the bear think? He thinks the dart is going to, thr as it throws its way, he thinks the dude's going to kill me. You know, he, he doesn't want my good, and this is, he, he doesn't want, he just only wants my death. So he shoots and it hurts and the hunter takes a large stick, prods the bear to move back of the cage to release the tension on the trap door. And while the bear is thinking that he wants to harm me, he wants to hurt me. Why would he allow this to happen? Well, says Peter Kreeft, he says, we cannot comprehend God's moves any more than that bear can comprehend the hunter's moves. It's a brilliant truth. We don't get the whole picture. We don't know what is the motive in the mind of God in allowing it. But suffering in the hands of a loving God can bring about great good. Now, if you're wondering what, what good could possibly come, I'm going to give you three this morning. Number one, suffering will keep you pure. Number two, suffering will keep you humble. And number three, suffering will keep you dependent on God. Now, I want you just to consider them for a moment as we move on. And we're going, to, we're going to talk about suffering will keep you pure first. And then we'll, we'll talk about all three of them. Maybe if you recall the words of Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1. It says, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, 
though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Isn't that a great picture? God, like a goldsmith, a goldsmith will, will put gold into a smelting furnace long enough to burn off the, all the impurities in the gold. Do you have any rough edges in your personality? Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm going to make a wild guess and just say that probably there's nobody here that is perfect. And probably you all have some rough edges in your personality. And I will guarantee you that suffering will be the sandpaper that smooths out them all out. Suffering will purify us. It will. Now the second thing is suffering does is it, it keeps us humble. It keeps us humble. Now I, I'd like you to turn your Bibles, as I mentioned at the beginning, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to read just a few verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and, and here's why. This is one of the most powerful passages penned by, by Paul, where Paul, the apostle, is very forthcoming. He's, he's very emotional. He opens his heart wide up. And in chapter 12, verse 1, he says, It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Now, so here's the deal. Paul, he has suffered from his enemies, and Paul has been accused by the very church that he gave his heart to for having impure motives and so on. And so he opens his heart and he goes, look, I don't want to brag and, and I don't want to boast, but but let me just tell you what God has done. I come to visions and revelations. Look at verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me lest I be exalted above measure. Four different times recorded in the Bible, God spoke to Paul personally. Boy, that, that would be a head trip. And so, so here's Paul, and, and he's godly, he's self-sacrificing, but even Paul admits, I still have this old flesh attached to me, and I can have a, I can have a problem when it comes to, be, to pride. And so God allowed these things to come upon me, the thorn in the flesh. It actually happens to like be a, the, an impaling stake. It's not really just the little thorn that you might get off a rose bush or something like that. I have this huge stake in, in some physical infirmity and a messenger of Satan but allowed by God. That's why Peter never entered into the ridiculous notion of binding the devil, because why would he be doing that against the very thing that God is using to, to perfect him? A messenger of Satan, a thorn in the flesh, lest I be exalted above measure. And I suppose it would have been hard for Paul he, he could have been, you know, like talking with, like, uh, Paul and, or with Silas, you know, and with Timothy. You know, maybe they would have a discussion concerning, like, like a plan that they want to do or something like that. And Paul goes, no, I, I think my idea might be better. And so they argue back and forth about it, but... You know, he goes, uh, like, uh, well, how many of you guys have been in, been to heaven? It's like, uh, I think we should go with my plan. 
Well, Paul said, what prevented him from that kind of pride, you know, keeping me humble by allowing suffering in my life. So it'll keep you pure. It will keep you humble. Third, it will keep you dependent. Verse 8. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times, and he said to me, my grace is enough. It's all you need. It's sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, reproaches, needs, persecutions, distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This affliction was enough to keep Paul going back and back, and back to God. Fix this, God. Heal me, God. Please, Lord. Three times it kept Paul dependent. Suffering draws us to God. Until finally the Lord said, you know what, Paul? Here's the secret. The weaker you are, the stronger I can be. When you come to an end of your strength, my power just then kicks in. No one is ever too weak to be powerful. But I've met plenty of people who are too strong to be powerful. I can handle this, no problem. You know, pl pretty sure I'm guilty of that myself. But to thinking about it, it's probably why I had a heart attack a couple of years ago. Only you, you've got plenty of your own strength. You know, let me know when you admit to your weakness. And God says, so that I can give you my strength. That's where Paul now says, I get it. I really get it. You know, I embrace the suffering. It, it makes me weak. And, and when I am weak, I am more dependent. So you wouldn't you agree that those are some three pretty really good things? It'll keep you pure. It'll keep you humble. And it'll keep you dependent. Now let's go back and, and finish out the story. Go to Job chapter 2. Let's look at, at his friends. This is the final stroke of the story here. In verse 11... Job's friends come, and they, they were at least his friends at first. They, they come as enemies when they, when they talk, but at least as long as they shut up, they're great. Verse 11. Now, when Job's three friends heard all this adversity had come upon him, each one came from his own place. you got to give them that. You've got to acknowledge that that's pretty powerful. Eliphaz, the Timonite, Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Naomithite. For they made an appointment together to come and mourn with him and to comfort him. And when they raised up their eyes from afar and did not recognize him, they lifted their voices and wept. And each one tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his head toward heaven. It, it, that, that's a sign of mourning of the dead. And so they sat down with him and on the ground, uh, in the ash heap on the ground, seven days and seven nights. And no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. Now, you know who these guys are, you know, Job's comforters. Yeah, yeah. Job will say later, miserable comforters you are. But, but at first, they are not miserable. 
At first, they're great. They, they come from a long distance. They show emotion for Job. They're not stoic. They sit with Job on the ash heap for seven days and seven nights, and they said nothing. So I think, Nimby, the next time you want to lamb blast you know, these dudes, you know, th think about, would you have done that? This is called the ministry of presence. Sometimes all you need to do is just sit there. Sometimes you don't need to say a word. Sometimes you don't need to do anything. Just be there. You know, you know, if you've been in a hospital, you know the joy of looking across the room when you wake up and seeing a family member or a very intimate friend who's there. They have no need to read you scripture or give you any advice. You know, like, let me tell you why I think you're suffering. None of that. They just are there. They just sit and pray with you. So here's the principle that I want you to see. Sensitive friends know when to come, how to stay quiet, and what to say, if anything. I wish his friends, you know, would have continued saying nothing. You know, just got up, got him soup, got him fresh water, you know, ministered to Job. But they didn't. They talked. And they, they talked, and, and when they did, it went downhill quick, quickly. Let, let me tell you why they did that. There's, there's a key point because, because we always get down on these guys, and they were true friends until they started pontificating. But, but the reason that they start pontificating is because of Job. In chapter 3, let's, see, let's hear his emotional outburst here. And don't miss this. Chapter 3, verse 1. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. Job spoke and said, May the day perish on which I was born and the night in which it was said, A male child is conceived. Now go down to verse 11. Why did I not die at birth? Why did I not perish when I came out of the womb? Now go down to verse 25. For the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. Now that's Job's outburst. That's his limbic system kicking in. His friends couldn't handle it. You, you might read and go, Job, I, I, wish you, I wish you wouldn't have said that. I, I wish you were doing you know, you were doing great back in chapter 2, you know, when, but then you opened your mouth. So it's the words of a suffering, of a deeply suffering person. And so he spoke that because his kids are all still dead. You know, you know and, and, and he still has this disease. And so he says, enough. This is enough. And, and as Frizz heard that and saw that emotional outburst, and listened carefully, they couldn't handle it. They couldn't just let the guy emote. They had to have, they had to give good reasons for Job's sufferings, suffering. And so they do. Let me give you a word to those of you who are well. If you're around somebody who is sick, don't try to explain everything. It doesn't help. The explanation won't help heal the hurting, broken heart. Just be there. Pray and, and love on them. And sometimes that's the best thing. They'll, they'll, they'll come from time to time. For There'll come a time when there's might be a time for explanation, but but this is not, not it. I want you to listen to the words of, of a sufferer who gives us insight. He said, 
I, I was sitting torn by grief. Someone came in and talked to me of, of God's dealings, of why this happened, of hope beyond the grave. He talked consistently and said things that I knew were true. I was unmoved except to wish that he'd just go away. And he finally did. Another came and sat beside me. He didn't talk. He didn't ask leading questions. He just sat beside me for an hour or more, listened when I said something, answered briefly, prayed simply, and I was moved. I was comforted, and I hated to see him go. Folks, it's so easy to play Monday morning quarterback with somebody else's sufferings. Somebody else is suffering and they say something like, and you go, I can't believe he's a Christian. And that they would say something like that. Just, just wait. Just wait. Walk softly around a broken heart. That's probably the, the best advice that I could give you. Walk softly around a broken heart. Very tender, very soft, very compassionate. Well, where does Jesus fit into all this? Remember what we've learned the, the past week in this. Evil does exist. That's obvious. God permits evil to exist. God has a purpose in evil existing. And what you need to know in closing is that God plays by his own rules. He doesn't put those truths into a universe and, and let us deal with them. He, he himself plays by those rules. You see, think of it this way. What would the worst possible thing ever be in human history? Well, I can answer that. The death of God. Killing God on the cross. Getting rid of God. That's the worst possible thing. Well, it may have seemed like the worst thing, but it actually turned out to be the very best thing. The worst thing that could have happened to Jesus Christ, his death, his suffering, has brought about salvation for the world if we will take it. And worship team, you guys can come up. And if you're here today and don't know Jesus, if, if you have never received him, if that truth is not good for you, I pray that this morning you will sit there in your seat and you will pray to him and ask him to come into your life because there is so much of this that doesn't apply to you. It's like you don't have God. When you suffer, and you will, we all suffer, you're not going to get rid of suffering if you become a Christian. You know, but we have Jesus walking us through it. He comes in to us. If you receive him, he will come into you if you receive him. And to have him with you going through your suffering is like 10 billion times better than going through it alone. So perhaps your pain, your affliction, your suffering would lead you to Christ. And leading you to Christ, put your name in heaven forever. And I would say it's worth it. And, and I hope that one day you'll be able to say, it's worth it. And one day you'll be able to be like Paul and say, I will rejoice in my infirmities, in my weakness, because it makes me pure and humble and dependent upon God. C.S. Lewis said, God whispers to us in our pleasures, but he shouts to us in our pain." Payne, said Lewis, is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. 
it gets, it gets people's attention. God has gotten my attention many, many occasions. And I can simply stand before you and say, all things work together for good for those who love God. 